dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. I think that all of us agree that preaching the gospel is a good thing. I think all of us understand that that actually forms the heart of our faith. But I don't think all of us understand how we who are engaged in the world, in secular business and in professions, can actually be expected to preach the gospel. What does it look like for a Catholic business leader or professional to preach the gospel? Hi, everybody. I'm just so glad to be back with you again. Thank you so much for taking the time out to invest in yourselves as a leader. And I can thank you for that because I'm, I am someone whose life is impacted by your leadership, just as is the life of so many people who receive your products, who receive your services, who are there in a world that's largely shaped by what you do. The simple fact is small to mid-sized businesses have an immeasurable impact on our culture, not only from the services that you provide and the output, but also by the culture that you create in your actual business and professional practices. And I just think it's amazing to be able to encourage you with the word of God for what you do. I mean, if you were just to go back, the the power of a teacher, you know, as you stand there in front of your students, I mean, I don't have any children because I'm a Catholic priest, but if I did have a child, you would be spending time with that child every single day. You don't think that the way that you hold yourself and the attitude that you are taking into that classroom won't have the biggest of effects on a child's life? I mean, I, I know all the teachers that I know, they definitely are aware of that. Because the great minds and the great leaders and the great people that are going to change the world tomorrow are all sitting at desks in front of you today. And so I'm convinced that what God wants for this world very much translates into a message that passes through your hands, your minds, your skill set. You are people who are on the front lines of evangelization and you just might not even know it. And yet you are. And so I want to thank you for taking the time to be formed and to allow yourself that luxury, really, of being ministered to by the Word of God. Because what is in the Bible is especially there for you today. And it's not something that we should just put off. It's actually an essential part of what you need in order to succeed in your leadership. And here's why. Because we all know that you've got to be successful in a worldly way. You have to be correct with your HR. You have to be correct with your salaries. You have to be correct in your management. Your objectives need to be intelligent and in smart format and all of that. It's, it's really good, okay? It's just that there's something else to you besides all that. And that is that whatever you do as a baptized Christian, you do as a member of the body of Christ. And that means that whatever you do and whatever you engage in as a baptized Christian is actually an instrument for the working of Christ as he works in our lives and in our world through the members of his body. You're his instrument. And your management and your business and your budgeting and your economy and your thrift and all that you're good at and all that you do, this actually is in a language that God is now speaking and a presence that God is giving to his world. And so I really want you to be formed spiritually in him so that you can not just be effective in your management and in your leadership, but that you can be effective as his instrument. And I know this applies equally 
for you at home. And that's what I so love about looking at a biblical understanding and a truly Catholic understanding of leadership because it applies across the board. If you're a leader in the workplace, it's a practice ground for where your real leadership takes place, which is at the home. Because no other culture is more dependent on its leader than the culture of the home. And no relationships are more dependent upon the, the relationship building skills of the leader than your marriage and your relationship with your children. And so if you're blessed with a job, it's practice, all right, for the real work, which is when you go back to your home and you're entrusted that larger and much more important field of action. I mean, it's when you're talking about parenting, you're talking about, you know, from volleyball coaching to violin lessons to taking care of health to working on recreational activities to speaking with a three-year-old to punishing a teenager. I mean, it's incredible. Your skill level is just, it's through the roof what's required of you to do that well. And so I think you can understand that I mean, if, you, if you're at work, it's so much easier in many ways because for as much as it's harder, it's a lot easier. It's very precise and very defined and it also has a limit. Whereas in the, in the family, man, the depth of what you do as a parent, you need all the help you can get and all the support you can get. And that's why I'm so pleased to preach God's word to you today. So let's go ahead and just bow our heads and ask the Holy Spirit to take over here and to help us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, Father of the poor, illumine the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. St. John, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, so if you remember where we're going here, I, I want to focus in with looking at Christ's mission at what what was it that brought him to this world what did he say about his mission as a way of better understanding our mission be it as a home at home as a mom or be it in front of a classroom of people or be it in front of a boardroom we all have a mission that's bigger than what we do Remember, it's almost like touching into the why that we do things. When you talk about Christ and Christianity, you're not at the level of a what. The what can be as varied as, as changing diapers to making a, a budget presentation in front of the board. It, it can be as, as broad as those things, but the why remains the same. And that our why is in conformity with the why of Christ because we are the members of his body. We are his followers and we are his instruments in this world. And so by understanding his why, we can better understand our own. And in fact, I don't think we can understand our why as powerfully as we need to without understanding his. And so let's read and see in sacred scripture what he has to say about his own coming so that we can be sent on our way more effectively. Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org. That's E-A-G-L-E-E-Y-E ministries.org. And subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. Subscribe today. All right, so let's open our Bibles here today and, and take a deep look at our Lord present, speaking in his hometown, in his synagogue. Right? This is, of course, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, where he speaks to us, quoting Isaiah, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Right? So we all know the situation, right? He's at Nazareth where he had been brought up. That's verse 16. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read and the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was given to him. And then, of course, verse 20 continues and it says, And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. Isn't that beautiful? I've come, therefore, so in this scene, he's quoting Isaiah the prophet, and yet as he's quoting Isaiah, he's actually applying the words to himself. So here you have Christ in a very eloquent way speaking to us about what his mission is, and he gives us different dimensions to it, right? He says, number one, he's here to proclaim the good news to the poor. He's here to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, liberty to those who are oppressed and to proclaim a year of God's favor. That's five different missions, but you can wrap them up, if you were, would, into one, and that is to proclaim the gospel, right? To proclaim the gospel to the poor, if you want to put it that first one, because that gospel to the poor, well, that sets people free, right? Those who are captive in all kinds of spiritual dimensions and then the practicality that comes from that gospel, the recovery of sight to the blind, same thing. That's a sign of the faith that comes to someone when they hear the gospel and the light that they receive in their souls. The liberty of those who are oppressed, same idea here, said so liberty to the captives, liberty to those who are oppressed. This is a truth of the human person and their, their course through history that sets them free from oppression. And then uh, the year of the Lord's favor. All of that's wrapped up in this first aspect, which is proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the good news, the evangelium in Greek. Okay, so this is why Christ came. And that what does that mean for him? And what does that mean for us in our professions and in the places where Christ is asking us to lead? How do I proclaim the gospel? I think for most of us, especially those who are Catholic, proclaiming the gospel is a, is a term that you usually think of as something that the priest does, right? Because at Mass, he, there's an Alleluia, and he stands up, goes over the podium, bows in front of the altar, says a prayer to be made worthy to proclaim the gospel, and then he stands up at the podium, and he reads the gospel to the people, and then he preaches that gospel. And so we say, well, gosh, she does that so well, you know, and I say, thank you, thank you. We priests do. We look really good when we do that. You know, we've got our, our wonderful chasuble on and there's flowers everywhere and there's music. And I mean, like, it's kind of our main, main time to shine. If you ever thought to yourself, man, I wish I had more attention in my life. All you have to do is become a priest. And then people will pay all kinds of attention to you, <laughs> especially when you start to preach on Sundays. And, and one of the problems with that is that maybe we look so good when we do it that the average Catholic anyway doesn't see that as necessarily being a part of their daily life. And I like to say that that's kind of too bad because if you look at what we include there in that proclamation of the gospel, setting freedom, freedom to the captives, freedom to the oppressed, recovery of sight to the blind, and the Lord's favor being proclaimed, if to the degree that you do not proclaim the gospel, everybody, you are letting those who are oppressed be oppressed. You're letting those who are enslaved stay in their slavery. You're leaving the blind out to stumble along their way. And no one knows that, in fact, God's blessing is upon the land and wants to be given to them in his Holy Spirit. There's a, a line from St. Paul that says it so well. He says, you know, you are saved by faith, but how do you get faith except if you hear the gospel preached. And how will you hear the gospel preached unless it's preached by someone? So in other words, God sends people to preach the gospel so that others hearing it might believe. And believing might therefore share in what we give them. 
God wanted his good news to be passed on to people by the proclamation, by the, the intellectual sharing, by the, the transmission of his truth. And that truth can be transmitted in many different ways. For Christ himself, he transmitted that truth by teaching, by miracles, and by his very presence in, amongst the people. And we can do the same. There's time for us to take up the microphone and to have sessions for business leaders so that they can hear the truth about the gospel as is proclaimed to them. But there's also times where it's the matter of what we do. I just want to warn you though, because there's this famous saying that people really like a lot and I like it too. And it's from, it's all, it's supposedly from St. Francis of Assisi. Although some people dispute that it's from him, but whatever. And it says this, it says, Preach the gospel always. When necessary, use words. And I love that saying, and it's incredibly powerful. Preach the gospel always. When necessary, use words. I guess what I don't like about it is that for so many of us, we very scarcely find it necessary to use words, you know? And then when something happens in our country, kind of like, you know, a pandemic situation where things get shut down, and every, suddenly no one can go to Mass anymore, we, we suddenly realize, gosh, like how many people don't go to Mass regularly just because they haven't been invited? I'd like to say, you know, preach the gospel constantly, when necessary, use words, and it most frequently is necessary to use words. <laughs> like when Christ was on the earth, he did not just walk around doing good to people. He did good to people, plenty, in order so that by his good deeds, it could reinforce what he was teaching them using words, right? And then, of course, the very base of the whole thing is by his very presence. So you could say, at the minimal, my presence near someone who's suffering or near someone who needs that presence, okay? That's my first level of gift. And then I can do things to help them and speak the gospel that way. But my friends, all of that is great. Just don't forget that it is also necessary to teach, to actually speak, to say a word that is effective because God wanted that to be part and maybe even the principal part of evangelization. And this was why Christ was sent. And therefore, it's also why we're sent. And we're going to look at that right now. Father Nathan has founded the St. John Institute, the MBA program that develops students into the leaders of tomorrow by giving them a missionary's heart and an entrepreneur's mind. Visit our website at stjohninstitute.org. Dare great things for Christ. All right, so in Luke chapter 4, we hear Christ really clearly saying that he was sent in order to proclaim the gospel. What does this exactly mean? Well, in a sense, this is at the heart of everything that we do, everything that the Catholic Church does, everything that we do as Christians. It all comes back to this fundamental proclamation, right? And that is to make this proclamation known, all right? And so what is the proclamation? That Jesus Christ is Lord, that he has died for our sins, that he has risen from the dead, that he is sent by the Father in order to bring the submission of faith to all peoples. Okay, great. How do I do this if I'm not a preacher at a pulpit? And I'd like to say, I, I, this is the good news, okay? Your professional life is, in fact, an expression of that gospel truth that you have been sent to proclaim. It's an absolute error to limit spirituality or the truth of the gospel to the realms of the heart and to emotions, when in fact, it not only touches the heart and the emotions, but the body and time and space and visibility as well. And the service that you render by taking care of a nursery of trees, you know, a tree nursery, and making sure those trees are healthy and giving an equitable price as you go about transplanting them and giving good advice to the people who are looking to redo their gardens and therefore beautify the world, it might seem like a humble task. And maybe it is a humble task to do that. But the fact is this, our life is made up of humble tasks, everybody. And we all know it. And the saints are the ones that accept it. 
and say, you know what? It doesn't matter if it's a humble task or not. This task needs to be done. I remember well talking with a, a woman who founded a ministry that helps women who have had abortions to face the truth of what they've done and to repent. And not only to repent, but to be healed and, and to st set forth their life in a good way moving forward. And I was speaking with her about some of the difficulties of the emotionality of that situation and how she copes with it personally. And she said a beautiful phrase to me. She said, Father, listen, I believe this. You should never tell someone that God loves them unless you do as well. Never tell someone that God loves them unless you do as well. What she was trying to say is that she copes with all of that by, in fact, loving the people herself, like taking them into her heart and, and serving them from the heart. And I think about this a lot in the line of burnout and even workplace work environment satisfaction. A lot of people struggle with that. And I get it. Sometimes you just have to leave the workplace environment you're in. You know, that's fine. But on, in other cases, what if you were to do it more from the heart, more from the attitude of saying, this work is actually my prayer where I glorify the Father. This is where I worship God by sacrificing my time and my energy and my creative forces and my patience and all of the sacrifices that it takes for me to do this job. I'm going to do that out of pure love for him. This job is my prayer to my God, right? Well, suddenly I think you'd understand what happens at Mass because then when you bring forward the bread and the wine for the consecration at Mass, what happens but that the priest takes your work, your sacrifices that you've given there in your workplace, the anxieties, the cares, the worries, the concerns, the challenges, the energy levels, everything that you've got to do to bring into that, you can put that forward on the altar as part of the host that the priest takes up and then in the person of Christ says, this is my body, which will be given up for you. And not only do you make it a prayer, but you make of that workplace a proclamation because the simple fact is if God were to walk in this world and see a blind man, would he heal him? The answer is yes. When you go through the gospel, it's exactly what happens. Now, there certainly were plenty of people that he didn't heal. And, and, and that's part of the will of God. And some people continue to carry their cross in that way. But when a person needed Christ in the gospel, he sought to meet their needs. When the people were, in fact, hungry, he didn't sit there and then say, you know, well, I'm not going to feed them. Let them starve. The apostles did. <laughs> Remember the apostles? They're like, hey, why don't you let these people go? It's getting late at night and we can never feed them. And Jesus says, give them something yourselves to eat. And he, he confronts them to say, you can't just, you know, just dis to dismiss them from their physicality. You need to take care of them because the love of God in its realism needs to meet the real needs of the people. Well, our real needs today is for construction engineers who, who, who stamp the blueprints well. It's for mayors that run their cities as if they were running them in the name of God. It's, it's for husbands and wives to take seriously their obligation of parenting. It's what we need today, in other words, is full of humble tasks. And just because it's a humble task, or it's not, it doesn't mean it's not a proclamation of the gospel. In fact, how exciting would it be if we caught this energy to say that the secular enterprises and the running of small and mid-sized businesses and the employment of 15 people at an organization that you get to create on your own, all of these things are actual ways for us to proclaim that this world has been redeemed. Right? The easiest way for people to believe that evil will have the final say is for the businesses of this world to be run by evil people in evil ways for evil ends. 
If on the contrary, we woke up and woke the sleeping giant called what we do for the majority of our day, you know, namely working, and we, and we woke the sleeping giant of what we do for the majority of our time, namely running our businesses, and we were to put that as a service of the truth of God, we'd be able to bring hope and say, you know what? We're actually going to bring beauty into this world. Our business doesn't exist just to make whatchamacallits. Our whatchamacallits exist in order that your world be better thereby. And if I'm engaged in leading that process of the creation of whatchamacallits, then I'm going to lead that very well because that proclamation of beauty is something the world is owed. And the proclamation of justice and fairness and equity and service. When you go into a company that's well run and you meet a culture of positivity and service and help and intelligent staff and, and people that actually act like they care, it's so much easier. Your whole day is made better. The service of the salesperson is enormous. We just saw an article the other day talking about a fellow from a fast food restaurant who was being lauded as everybody knew and they went to this restaurant just so that they could meet this guy because of the level of energy and positivity and love that he exuded. And this guy actually said, you know, I'm a, super, I'm a superhero just without the cape. And then he said, went on to say, I wish more people had that attitude. And I'd like to say we all do, don't we? Because in fact, that's the way we should be as Christians. We are superheroes. We're the redeemed of God. And we just don't have our cape. What we have instead are our businesses, our business practices, our communication styles. We need to take that energy, take that opportunity that we have and proclaim the gospel there by the service that we do, the sacrifices that we make, and yes, my friends, in the chances that we have, even by using words. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.